Good afternoon in New York. Good morning in Oregon and California. Good evening in Vienna and Cape Town. And welcome whatever time or day or night you are for all of you joining us from all corners of the world. I'm Yael Danieli, founder and executive director of the International Center for the Study, Prevention and Treatment of Multigenerational Legacies of Trauma, ICMGLT for short. Thank you for joining us, our celebration of women's multigenerational preservations, transformations uh, webinar. Before we begin, let me acknowledge with deep gratitude and appreciation the contribution of ICMGLT board member and secretary, Dr. Mary Fabry, to this as to many other ICMGLT's important events. This International Center for the Study, Prevention and Treatment of Multigenerational Legacies of Trauma webinar is held in anticipation tomorrow of International Women's Day to celebrate women's achievement, raise awareness about multi, excuse me, raise awareness about discrimination and take action to drive gender parity. <clears throat> Three international multidisciplinary participants will review and reflect upon personal, family, community histories of trauma, differing ways of emerging, expressing, learning from, and overcoming their traumatic dis dis discrimination, multi-generational histories, while continuing to successfully meet contemporary challenges. And the, and the fourth will not only help the translation when needed, but will bring us a lot of beauty. And uh, thank you, Laura Lee. Your moderator, me, I'm a clinical psychologist, victimologist, pioneer traumatologist, and psychohistorian. I devoted much of my career to studying, treating, writing about, and preventing lifelong and multi-generational impacts of massive trauma to victims' rights, to rights of future generations and to reparative justice. I conceive of history as related to our webinar as it is lived now, not only as a set of dates and events, but it is happening shape, it, it, as it, it shapes our identities and guiding our choices today. Our first speaker is Nassim Bargi, who introduces herself in the following. My grandmothers both married before 10 and illiterate, faced a different era. Mom, with limited schooling, wed at 15 and became a homemaker. In contrast, the family aimed for my siblings and me to be doctors. However, I chose my path becoming a nurse. Reflecting on the disparities with my grandmothers unveils our evolving family narrative that was made possible by my father's education and enlightenment, opening doors to new possibilities for women in my family. Today's spe second speaker is ICMGLT's Advisory Council member and chair of our working group on women, Irene Ochen. And Nassim, would you please forgive me? I omitted to mention that Nassim is co-chair with Irene of this important working group. Forgive me. 
listed as one of Nigeria's 100 most inspiring women. Irene Ochem is founder and executive, chief executive officer of Africa Women Innovation and Entrepreneurship Forum, an award-winning Pan-African organization dedicated to fostering women's economic inclusion and empowerment through entrepreneurship support and development. With special consultative status with the United Nations Economic and Social Council, as is ICMGLT, the organization is a continental platform for driving inclusive economic transformation for women and works to close the gender gaps in entrepreneurship and innovation in Africa. Our third speaker is Simona Anuzi, granddaughter of Romani, Austrian artist, writer, and activist Cheya Stoika, played a major role in the artist's life. Simona represents the next generation whom Che Kastoika wanted to educate about the beauty of Romani cultures and the horrors of their past under national socialism. Romani, Simona has read her grandmother's poems at exhibits and commemorations of the Romani genocide and authored an essay on her grandmother. Last but not least is Dr. Laura Lee French, who for our webinar volunteered to help both in showing Czech Hastoika art and in translating Simona's German into English when needed. Thank you so much, Laura Lee. A distinguished professor of German at Pacific University, Oregon, Lorelei has published extensively on Che Kastoika, including the first English translation of her memoirs. She has co-curated exhibits at the Austrian Cultural Forum New York and forthcoming at Abenese Museum Austria. She received the National Endowment for the Humanities grant to work with Karina Kurta, Che Kastoika International Association, and Nuna Stoika, Stoika's daughter-in-law, on Stoika's notebooks. So we have the voice, the progressive voice of Iran, Africa, the Romani people, East and West Coast here. We have an hour and a half for the webinar. Each of our panelists will speak for about 11 minutes. Following an interchange among us, I will open the floor to questions or brief comments from the virtual audience. We will then conclude with last words. Please use the chat function and we'll do our best to respond to as many as we can. Feel free to direct your question to a particular panelist or to the full panel. I now have the pleasure to offer the screen to nurse <laughs> Nazim Baghi. Nazim, the screen is yours. I think you may need to, uh, to. Sorry, okay. Yes, <laughs> hi. Hi everyone, um, thank you so much. This is a true honor. I'm just a nurse. I don't do stuff like this. I'm just gonna talk about my own experience here. Um, I'm a woman, um, I'm a mother, I'm a nurse, I'm an immigrant and I'm a wife sometimes. Uh, I live in San Diego uh, for past 21 years, but my home is actually Iran and my experience comes from mainly Iran. And I like to focus on my generational changes that took place between my grandmother's generation and my own. But in order to understand uh, 
the magnitude of these changes, it's necessary to, for me to explain a little bit about like Iran's political and cultural situations when it comes to women. Uh, culturally in the past, my grandma's era, women's role was to bear as many children as they could and to attend endless domestic chores. Basically that was the life. There was really, truly nothing more than that. However, um, in my time, my generation, the expectation for us to reach as highest possible educational as possible that we could. Uh, as uh, you mentioned in my uh, biography, my grandmothers were married off at age 10. One of them was uh, engaged at age three, four, five, something like that to older cousin in order to keep the family wealth in the family. That was a horrible, horrible situation for her. She ended up with huge traumas in her life and she carried that depression and trauma for the end of her life. Basically, she was depressed for until the day that she passed away. Uh, they both were illiterate and this was not an exception. So when I uh, I tried to look at the statistics, I couldn't find anything regarding women's literacy 100 years ago, but I was able to find that the first woman uh, school was opened in 1907 in Capital, and it was only open for very limited people, very probably very open-minded, very wealthy people. And it wasn't open for most of the majority of the population that lived in villages. Um, so it means before 1907, there was absolutely zero schooling for women and girls to attend. So literacy probably was next to zero for women. Nowadays, the literacy rate for women is 86% above age of 15. And um, the higher education, bachelor's and up, is 57% for women currently, as of 2020 um, statistics. So that was a culture as all of time. And then in 1925, um, more secular government, more like semi-modern government came. They opened up some schooling for kids, for girls. Uh, for example, my mother was able to attend school, uh, but just on, only at, up to sixth grade. Uh, but and things were getting a little bit better, and um, until 1979, that uh, Islamic revolution happened, and everything came to a very abrupt halt for women. All of a sudden, women were stripped of the few rights that they had completely and legally and systematically. And things just basically overnight, women's life turned upside down. I like to right now mention to um, this woman, amazing woman, a uh, political prisoner. Her name is Nargis Mohammadi. In a letter that she wrote to UN secretary, she defined Iran's regime as gender apartheid regime. And in a very comprehensive letter, she mentioned how she, by details actually, she outlined how and why Iran's regime systematically and legally keeping women down and take like an uh, imposing physical, emotional abuse on women. And it does actually, for example, if you go out without hijab, that would consider 74 lashes uh, right there and then. And it was just a year and a half ago that this woman died uh, just because her hijab wasn't perfect uh, by the uh, Islamic police, but by the hijab police. So consider that culture that was very poor towards women and consider the systematic legal system that's been place to systematically keep women down and consider the new generations, the gener my generation and generation after mine, how we excelled and thrived despite the whole 
system and culture. And I want to emphasize to give the credit to women, not to anybody else, not to government, not to culture, nothing. It was just a woman by themselves that they were able to overturn this huge hurdle, huge obstacle to opportunity and go and get educated and get empowered. So my grandmother's situations was not an exception, basically. So they were very common. And my situation, getting an education and emphasizing on education is not uncommon either. So this is kind of a trend in the generation. So basically, two generations before was almost completely illiterate. The middle generation was semi, depends on the family, depends where they lived. They had some educations. And my generation, that among my friends, I'm the least educated one. Rest of them, they all have doctorate's degree. <laughs> but I'm a rebel. I'm okay with that too. Uh, so same situation, but much worse is happening in Afghanistan for women of Afghanistan, for my sisters in Afghanistan. And they experienced like moments like freedom, 20 years of freedom. They were able actually to go to universities, to, to hold great jobs and everything. And it just came to an halt like two years ago by Taliban coming up. I can't, their situations is in such a dire uh, condition that I can't really wrap my head around that. Um, they really need a lot of international helps. Uh, they're great women. They're very brave. They do everything they could. But with this legal system that has everything against women, it's very hard to excel. Um, and again, I want to emphasize, and I can't emphasize enough on how all these improvements from zero illiteracy to 86% in women only happen through the middle generation's education. So basically my father's generation, they were sent to the cities from villages to get education. And they were able to become doctors, teachers, engineers, and for their next generation, women's situation changed 100%, not 100%, of course, but like drastically, very drastically. We can't, like, I can't even, like, probably my grandmothers, they could never, they could have never imagined what their granddaughters could do. Um, and it's all in light of the education of the middle generation that made it happen. Um I, again, I want to talk about my schooling a little bit uh, since I have a little bit of time. So I did go to a very special school and the uh, expectation was to, as I said, to be, have higher education. But at the same time, we always had this um, government's shadow and government's overseeing the schools and emphasizing on, yes, you will have higher education, but yeah, but at the same time, you are not the uh, you are the secondhand citizen. You are not the first level of citizen. So the citizenship is another issue that is still a huge issue. So, for example, women they cannot apply for a passport to travel overseas. There are a lot of uh, athletes, women, uh, that their husbands or fathers simply they could say. I'm not allowing you to go to Olympics and they can't hold a passport to go. So education is great. We have the education, we have some power, but still the social structure and legal structure binds us to be basically um, way below men in the society. And we have a long way to go. And... Um, I don't know how, but people are working very hard. And again, I want to mention Nargis Mohammadi's name. She's a Nobel Peace Prize winner. And she is basically sacrificing her life in prison uh, to be able to provide for other women, like the freedom that they deserve and they, that they need. At the end, I want to talk about woman life freedom. 
Um, that is my model these days. And it basically, um, it's a, a slogan of our revolution. It's not a full-blown revolution yet, but it's happening. And the focus is on women, women's power. And um, the reason is women has been deprived of all the rights for many years. So this revolution emphasizes on women, but the life is for everyone. It's men, kids, animals, environment, everybody, life includes all of them and freedom that brings all of them together. Thank you again for this opportunity. I really appreciate that for letting me talk about my, my experience, my people's experience and my grandma's generation. I appreciate that. I'm going to provide the link for that uh, gender apartheid regime and a couple of statistics here. Thank you so much, Nassim. <laughs> and yes, everybody, put everything in the chat so people can take it with them. And we have, we, I just saw that uh, we have with us uh, uh, from uh, uh, Salim Ula from Bangladesh Rohingya refugee camp. Uh, so, uh, I promise to the whole world, and we have it with us, and and so we cannot be more supportive uh, than than we began or began already. Uh, Irene, the screen is yours, <laughs> and me unmute, please. Yes. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, good evening from Cape Town. Um, good morning, wherever you are. Good afternoon. Um, yeah, thank you so much for inviting me to be on this um, um, webinar today. Um, tomorrow, like we know, is International Women's Day. And so it's a very special day for all of us, but um, a much more special day for people like us, uh, people like me that drive, um, you know, gender equality, so to say. I, I have started also describing myself as um, a gender rights uh, activist, <laughs> economic rights, you know, specifically. Um, we are talking about um, <clears throat> intergenerational transformation, you know, and um, like you can see, uh, I am an African. <laughs> um, I'm a Nigerian by birth and uh, by origin, uh, but um, I've lived um, part of the young part of my life in Nigeria and then the adult part of my life in Europe, and then um, I am back to Africa now. Um, when I was growing up, um, I think this, what I, have, I ended up doing now, driving um, economic uh, rights for women, I would talk about my organization and uh, what we do and, what, and how we do it. But before I do that, a little bit of um, my personal background, which actually um, informs what uh, I have ended up uh, doing, how I have um, um, reinvented myself. Um, I experienced, um, you know, the importance of a woman being economically empowered because I was raised by um, a mother who got widowed very early in her marriage. And then um, she found herself with um, five uh, kids, you know, to feed and to educate and to raise all alone. And all her life, she decided to do that um, all alone. And um, I happened to be the only girl, you know, her only daughter. The other four, my four siblings are, are male. So for her, um, as I was, when I was a child, um, I didn't understand why it was very, very important for her that I, I paid attention to my education and that, um, you know, but as a little child, she wouldn't say many things to me. But as I got older, I understood, you know, because I could see the challenges she was having um, to raise um, um, five children. 
So she made it a point of duty to see that I had um, very solid um, and quality education, which then um, let, set me you know, to um, go for whatever um, I needed to do, to do my further education and all that when I was living in Europe and all that. So um, I did work when I started working in Europe, I did work for the UN, UN agency. But when I came back to Africa um, for different circumstances again, okay, um, in, in my career space and all that, finally led me um, after she died to deciding to do um, what I am doing now. And that is, uh, so in 2015, I founded, uh, I was back to Africa, and I founded um, this organization called uh, Africa Women Innovation and Entrepreneurship Forum. So AWIEF, and um, we are now an award-winning organization. We are a nonprofit organization, women's economic organization specifically, reaching um, across 47 African countries. And um, what, are, what, what is our main goal? It is to accelerate efforts to address uh, gender inequality and to drive inclusive uh, economic transformation for women um, in the African continent. We do this, um, so in essence, like uh, you said during the introduction, we work to close the gender gaps in entrepreneurship. We foster women's economic inclusion and empowerment through um, supporting women to start and to grow profitable and sustainable businesses. Uh, personally, I believe that um, to address most of the issues of um, gender, um, it is important you know, to start with economic empowerment because um, I believe that an economically, and my mother taught me this, that an economically empowered woman is in a position, is a, is a woman that has a voice. Um, she's a woman that can take decisions that affect her life. She's a woman that can walk out of, um, you know, gender violence and um, a, a relationship that is not um, to her favor. Uh, she's a woman that can educate her children, invest in her children's uh, education, and then that generational economic empowerment can continue. Um, it flows into the community, it flows into the countries, and then um, finally it contributes to growing Africa's um, economy and Africa's uh, GDP. And that is what our theory of change um, is kind, you know, kind of um, is. So uh, I believe that uh, when there is economic empowerment, we can solve all the, uh, some of the other um, challenges of, um, of gender inequality and that. So um, the impact of our work is then ge achieving gender equality and inclusion is job creation, is increased African um, um, economic growth, improved economic growth, is improved economic rights uh, for women, is uh, women's you know, driving in um, increasing women leadership in every um, aspect of it, political leadership, uh, social leadership, economic uh, leadership. It gives women increased agency for women, which is then linked to transformational gender um, relations. So coming back to Africa, of course, um, um, achieving this is very, very difficult. Um, the gender agenda is, um, is a global um, agenda, is a global phenomenon. But on the African continent, um, it is much more pronounced. Africa is um, a patriarchal um, you know, society. Uh, so we have um, a, a lot of entrenched barriers you know, in, this, in the system, starting with policies and laws uh, legal, legally. You know, Nassim spoke about really legal um, you know, uh, the barriers. So we have systemic policies and laws you know, that favor gender inequality and then continue to entrench uh, gender bias and uh, discrimination. We have um, women uh, not having um, equal access, but very limited access to, the res to resources, to skills, to networks, you know, to start and grow businesses when we talk of uh, entrepreneurship. So they have 
have um, the inep unable to access um, funding markets and the, uh, okay, the critical networks. And this leads to having um, few role models. And then they also lack family support in many cases because uh, even the men, the husband, the brothers, the fathers even, they feel threatened by an economically empowered um, um, women. So, and um, these are some of the issues, the challenges that we work around, you know, to address, to find solutions to. We have another uh, challenge and which is the women themselves, because, um, because of the barriers, the social norms and the uh, cultural norms and cultural barriers, women themselves uh, lack self, uh, lack confidence and trust in themselves. So that's also another issue that we try to address. They have a lower self-motivation and risk tolerance. And then they are not ex encouraged you know, to excel um, alongside um, their male um, counterparts. And um, so as an organization, my organization, this is what um, we try to work around. We have lots of uh, entrepreneurial programs uh, that we design, co-design with different uh, partners, global and um, international organizations, uh, USAID from, um, the, from the United States, African Development Bank, European Union, GIZ, you know, development partners, but also corporate uh, partners. We have a program with them. Um, NetBank, which is a, a bank in South Africa, we have with Victoria's Secret out of the US. You know? So we, um, we've we worked and we continue to work with, with uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. They are also a supporter of, um, of our WIF. So we, uh, we are really lucky, you know, partnering um, with different stakeholders to drive the agenda. Um, it's not all, um, I, I, don't, I, th I think I still have some time, no? Yeah, yes. So I can, um, it's not, things are improving, but they are very, very slow. I would um, like to give an example with Nigeria, you know, um, we are which, uh, my birth country and where I come from. Um, we see, we are seeing, uh, uh, you know, small increases, you know, small um, improvements. Especially in the in the corporate um, in the corporate sector, okay. Um, Nigeria, of course, uh, is a patriarchal society like most other African countries, you know. But uh, the economic, the empowerment of women is gradually, um, you know, and steadily growing, and um, turning the tide in some male-dominated um, sectors like. Um, uh, the banking and financial um, sector, and also the oil and gas. Uh, presently in Nigeria, out of 24 commercial banks, nine of those banks have uh, female um, CEOs. And um, so this is impressive, um, it's encouraging, yeah, and it's, it's intentional, you know, it's something that is a result of uh, intentional skills building and, and leadership, um, you know, development. So, um, there is need to get the buy-in of uh, men. And we are seeing that in that high corporate sector where you also see men uh, supporting women, uh, growing them, you know, and sponsoring them into taking up um, roles, um, you know, as, as CEOs um, in these uh, corporate, um, you know, set, uh, businesses. Um, also, um, women in energy, okay, that is also um, improving. But um, when it comes to things like uh, women on boards, you know, appointing women to as uh, board directors across the continent, that is uh, going very, very slow. The average, uh, um, uh, the continental average is at um, maybe 14%. Uh, so, and um, I think um, that is um, um, quite slow. Um, climate, um, you know, change is something that is also creating huge opportunity, economic opportunities. But um, we are also trying now to focus attention there because climate change, climate crisis uh, on the continent here in Africa, it disproportionately impacts women. And then you have um, a lot of women operating at the level we are um, yeah. So we are um, green energy, green economy is uh, growing. And we want to ensure that 
women are not uh, again marginalized, you know, because um, um, a lot of uh, economic opportunities are coming out of um, the climate cri uh, crisis. So um, it's, a, it's an area that uh, where we are focusing um, attention and trying to also ensure that uh, women uh, build skills. At the formal business sector on the continent, and um, um, also in Nigeria, I was given an example with Nigeria. What we see is a 50-50 you know, ratio at the lower levels, but then this decreases um, as you go up the corporate um, uh, ladder. Um, according to um, a World Economic Forum research, for example, in Nigeria, 64% of skilled workers are women but only 30.3% are senior executives. So we still have these uh, entrenched um, barriers. At the informal and the uh, SMEs um, level, women are well, uh, much, much well um, represented, accounting for 41% of micro businesses. You know? But these are micro businesses that have uh, little or no growth uh, potential. You know, they are mostly women, who are in business for necessity, what we call uh, entrepreneurship for necessity, not because you know, they are there because um, there are no well-paid uh, formal employment for them. So for survival, they get, they get into business and they are usually very micro businesses that um, can't um, go uh, much, you know, see much growth. So um, the picture is um, more or less the same across uh, Africa, we have um, about 5% uh, of professional women who make it to top management in companies, you know? And um, when this uh, small percentage of people, when they are also in male dominated sectors, uh, usually, they usually are not as influential, you know, as they, as they should, as their male uh, counterparts. So how do we um, make a shift? How do we change things? Um, we, we need to change the social um, norms and to tackle mindsets, mindsets, okay? Uh, address uh, advocacy with policymakers so that they can make policies that create a better enabling um, um, environment for women. Education is key, okay? Education for me is education, is education, is education. That is what made it possible for me to be here speaking to you today. And um, that is uh, where it all starts. So um, the girl child um, should uh, be educated, should have equal access to education. The girl child should have access to STEM education, you know, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So that because um, um, that is, uh, as we go move forward, that those are the spaces where you get more benefits. And then uh, we build skills. And with building skills, we also work on soft skills, you know, building the, the confidence and then um, creating um, role models who then catalyze more um, transformation. So I think, um, I don't think I have more time. So I will stop here. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you again for having me. Right. Thank you so much, Irene, for. <laughs> for uh, sharing this with, with our world. I, I hope many more people will learn from what Nassim and you have been teaching. And, and we have yet to hear so much more in beauty. And, and so, uh, and thank you between you, you know, being, shedding light on all of the different dimensions where women have to be empowered to, to become the change makers that they're perfectly able to be, that we are perfectly able to be, not they. And, uh, <laughs> and education, education, education. I will just throw your way that even in this progressive planet, Nassim said, I am just a nurse. And Irene said, of course, Afri Africa is patriarchal. So let's just keep in mind that even among us, we are still, we, we are, uh, 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 nothing called it a shadow. 
right? We are shadowed still. And, and, and it's very important to acknowledge those shadows while we celebrate us getting into the light and giving light to the world. Uh, and also, Irene, I would like you later to speak about uh, perhaps to further said, shed light on, uh, uh, I believe these are findings that when women uh, prosper, the whole society prosper. So, so uh, this is very important, right? It's not against anybody, it's for the future, it's for the next generation. Uh, but uh, uh, I'm so glad to see, and, and Laura Lee, would you please unmute yourself? Uh, we are now going to be exposed to a lot of beauty, I promise you. And uh, <laughs> a whole other, <laughs> a whole other very important human story <laughs> about women. So who's going to go first, Laura Lee or Simona? Yeah, I think I'm going first. Uh, yeah, this is beautiful. Thank you so much. And I do love the segue that Nassim talked about education and education, then education. with education and economics. And now we turn to art and beauty in mm -hmm. Chaya Stoika's works and Simona's words. Um, I'm going to share my screen here to show you some of the artworks that we, um, and to talk a little bit, to give a bit of context about Chaya Stoika. Um, this comes from our website for the Chaya Stoika International Association. And here you have a picture of her. She was born in 1933 in Austria to a traveling family. She was one of six children and she would often travel with her extended family in the wagons. Um, you will see here underneath her uh, picture, this tree branch. And this will have a major significance in uh, Simona's story, as well as in the artwork that I'm going to show you. I'll explain a little bit about that. Um, but when she was uh, nine years old, she was deported to Auschwitz concentration camp because the Roma were also ethnically persecuted under National Socialism. Her father had died in 1942 in a, a euthanasia um, place in Austria. So you'll see here on her arm, the tattoo that she received in Auschwitz, the Z was for the so-called Zigeuner, um, the gypsies, and then her number was 6399. And she always wore this very proudly in pictures and um, on streetcars, and she has stories about people asking her about that. Um, but when she was in her mid 50s, she started to write and to paint. And so she, this was in the 1980s. And so um, she used painting as a method to overcome trauma and writing as well. So here's a picture of her mother. Her mother played a major role in her life because her father had died when she was um, six, seven years old. And the mother was also with her in the camps. So this is a picture of the scenery that she remembered before the war when the family was traveling. Beautiful meadows, the wagons, this is a wedding. And she often painted sunflowers. That's why I have these behind me too. The sunflower for her was the flower of the Roma people. She would see these in the fields of Austria as she would travel around. And she painted fields of flowers. These are poppies. You'll often see in her paintings, cornflowers, um, beautiful meadows with, with wheat, and et cetera. So um, painting really brought her hope. After Auschwitz, uh, she was there for almost a year and a half. All the people, the Roma people who were in Auschwitz were gassed on the evening of August 2nd and 3rd. Um, uh, over, they estimate over 4,000 of them were gassed, but Chaya and her mother and her siblings were able to uh, um, es escape that terror. And she went on to be, um, Ravensbrück, which was a women's concentration camp north of Berlin. 
And she stayed there for about um, six months. And then she went on to Bergen-Belsen, where she was liberated with her mother in um, April of 1945. And so she continued to write. This is a picture from her notebooks. I, um, Yael mentioned that I'm working on the notebooks now with Karina Korta and Nuna Stoika, and Simona's going to join that project too. Over five, um, 4,000 pages of notebooks that she wrote, where she illustrated as well as wrote um, in Romani language and in German. She did not have a formal education. She only went through the second grade, but she took up writing as she spoke, um, as she went on in life. But this is a, another kind of art that she started to produce in reaction to being in the concentration camp. So these are ink, these are ink and um, pen drawings. And this one I particularly chose because it is about Bergen-Belsen, which Simona is gonna tell us a little story about. Um, and it's saying, you know, the allies were our, our um, liberators. And in the bottom, I mentioned the branch here. You'll see a bit of it here or in um, the other painting here. That became her signature in her art because at Bergen-Belsen, her mother told her they had to eat the leaves and the bark and the tree of, and the tree branches of a certain tree that they had access to in the barracks. And so she ate that sap and the tree and the bark, and she claimed that's what kept them alive. And so in almost all her paintings and artwork, you'll see this branch here um, to commemorate that tree. And then, um, so this, what Simona is going to tell us the story about was the essay that uh, Yael mentioned at the beginning that Simona has written for this publication that we just came out with, Chaya Stoika's artworks. And um, so I will hand it over. Maybe I'll show one last, oh, this is, um, yeah, this is Simona's essay here in the book. And um, another image that comes up often are the ravens, and they belong to the natural forces that she would see in the concentration camp as well, both a signifier of death and life. And so to end with this beautiful painting here on a, a note of hope that, uh, <laughs> you know, often we see trees, rainbows, colors in her paintings to show that... Um, trying to overcome the trauma. So I will give this over now to Simona, who will tell a lovely story of her relationship with her grandmother. Yeah, I could see Simona shushing her little daughter, Chaya, who is in the room. So you can see that the name goes from her grandmother to the daughter too. So give her a kiss for me and please, Simona, speak to us. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, it's a pleasure to be with you, wonderful ladies. And yeah, for me, my grandma, we call, in our language, we call grandma mommy. She was a hard woman, strong woman. And but yeah, for that, that she didn't went to school just to the first school, she, her life was amazing. Everything she did, it came something out. So for me, this woman is like a queen to me. <laughs> and she was invited to Bergen-Belsen uh, for the uh, anniversary to the 45th. And she took my auntie Luna and me, and I was, I think, 12 or 13 years old. So, and for me as a grandchild, she, she, it was my first time to go in such dark place. So it was a journey because we took, she, she, she was driving the long way from Austria to Germany, and it, it's a long way. So at the middle on, on this way, driving the car, she said to us, okay, we, we need a rest, we will spend 
uh, by motor and sleep at night and then drive on. So in our room, there was a double bed and a Murphy bed. And immediately she saw this Murphy bed. She, she told me, nah, Simona, you are not sleeping there. You are sleeping with us. This Because it reminds her too much of these barracks in Auschwitz, bergen Bess, and Ravensbrück. It, 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 her fears came out. So I said, mm -hmm. okay, I spent with you. So the next day we drove to to, to Hanover. We there were a lot of people. So we had a nice welcome and dinner. So the next day we had free time time for ourselves. And my grandmom's wish was to go there alone not with these people to mm -hmm. to check up how how it is yeah so we said okay we are going with you and you don't see any barracks there is everything was burned you don't you just see small years in one you see 2000 dead 3,000, 4,000, 500. You just see, that's it, yeah? And, but for me, as for me, was, I was shocked. Like, wow, this massive graves. There are people inside. It's not that just a year, what you normally hear. Yeah, there are people inside. So my grandma was walking and we asked her, where are you going? And she, she, she said to us, okay, I'm searching for, for my bara. Like, okay, but how do you want to, to find it? And she said, yeah, just leave me, just leave me. Okay, so we left her and she was walking. And then she said, suddenly, this is the place. This, this is the place. So, so then she was sitting there and said, okay, when the barrack is, was here, where is my tree where my mom told me I should suck on it and eat the leaves because Ben Benson, this, this camp was to die. Mm -hmm. There was no food anymore. There was... Mm -hmm. Nothing. The people die because the, nobody cares about them there. So she went up and saw a tree and said, like, okay, this tree, 45 years have passed. You were a young tree. Hmm, are you the tree? She was talking to him. So and then she 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 remembered that this tree had a notch. Mm -hmm. And suddenly she saw this notch and said, Yeah, you are, you are my tree. <laughs> That's why I survived. And at the moment, uh something fell down from the tree. And she she took it, and that's why you see it everywhere. Yes, but yeah, it's, it, it touched, it touched. It was really touching. And even, even uh, um, when the, when the uh, Ali, they, they came, she was afraid and uh, she don't know how to speak English or something. So they asked her, where are you coming from? And she just remember, Austria, Tabak. <laughs> I said like Austria, but she, she, she didn't, yeah, it was her luck, it was Austria. <laughs> yeah, 
that's my, the story of the tree. And she she make a nice sentence. What it, uh, it comes comes from her heart and is is in my heart. It's like nature is my life, and I like to walk on the tree. Yes, I say thank you. Thank you. I knew I cried the end. And you see that not only Laura Lee has the flowers, which, by the way, they're not only Roma flowers, they're the Ukraine flowers, too. You know, Laura Lee. And Simona, of course, has those gorgeous, uh, has that gorgeous nature there, too. And, and so when you talk about the evolution of this panel, when you think about the importance of women to survival of the human species, when you talk about our relationship to nature and to beauty, and to put it all together with the economic and the professionalism and education, that we really can make the world a better place, even despite, despite the horribleness of what we, what we live with every single day. And I'm very glad, Nassim, that you mentioned our Afghani sisters. And of course, remember the Sudan and remember all the wars that are going on today, Eritrea, etc. We can go literally continent by continent about right the 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 struggle that ensues when women do contribute, and then right there is the the resistance against it. But I hope that just from these amazing presentations, uh, we will gain some hope, uh, some very justifiable hope, not just magical hope to feel good. And, and you know, I've seen the exhibit, and I love the art, and I love Simona. And her husband, of course, is also Nigerian, which is amazing too. <laughs> we have an amazing, <laughs> we have an amazing relationship on this panel, right? <laughs> United States, Iran, Africa, <laughs> Austria, <laughs> etc. Well, the West Coast, East Coast. <laughs> uh, so uh, I wonder, if, you know, this is the time for uh, the dialogue among you. Do you. Does any one of you have a comment or a question to anyone else on the, on the, uh, on the on the panel before we open the floor to the question and answers from the audience? I wonder. Go ahead. The floor is yours. Everybody, please unmute. Go ahead, Laurie, please. <laughs> um, yeah, for Irene, I have a question because you made the statement about climate change affecting women in particular. I think we all have an idea of that, but I'm wondering, can you expand a bit and especially from, from your perspective in Africa? Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Laurel. Um, Yes, uh, when I said that uh, climate change um, in Africa disproportionately affects um, women. Um, where we are seeing most the impact of uh, climate change, for example, the in food security and the agricultural sector. Uh, yeah. And um, more than 70% of uh, agricultural practice on the African continent is in the hands of women because uh, it is subsistence agriculture. It's a rural agriculture. It's a survival agriculture. 
okay, not mechanized agriculture. And um, climate change, um, droughts, or whatever you know you are seeing as uh, the impact of climate change is destroying agricultural practice. It's destroying um, you know um, coastal livelihoods like uh, fishery, aquaculture, and things like that. And these are um, um, in um, areas where women you know operate. So yeah. Then you, if you are talking also about um, energy access, okay, that is also um, disproportionately impacting um, women. So uh, the opportunities that are coming out of um, green and um, smart energy solutions, um, we need to ensure that women are not marginalized. Um, in Africa, women um, are the... Uh, uh, most consumers and the, the most uh, decision makers when it actually it comes to energy consumption, you know, because um, it's, it's rural energy consumption. The women are the ones that will go to fetch firewood, you know, to for energy. They are the ones to go to fetch water, you know, yeah, for water. So they are the ones to grow. Uh, small crops and vegetables and all that and where you they can't um, do this because of the uh, climate change and um, you know actions, challenges then um, they are um, unequally affected so and that is why we need to ensure that um, opportunities coming out of there that they are part of that um, narrative and that they are part of um, you know, getting opportunities to create um, something out of the solutions that we we have to um, come up with to address um, climate change. And those solutions are in green economy and in blue economy. Okay. Thank you. Great. Uh -huh. Wonderful. Any other question or comment, Nassim, Simona, uh, Irene? Do you to each other's questions. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, please, Nancy. I'd like to have a comment um, that about education. We've been talking about education. Sometimes or very often we, um, as Iranian, we, um, uh, we make fun of our culture and its emphasis on the education that becomes really exaggerated. And for our, for example, for my parents, our happiness, our education comes before our happiness, basically. <laughs> and the reason is because uh, it truly it makes such a huge difference in our lives and like in our path to happiness. So our parents have seen that basically the middle key to for us to reach to the happiness through education so yes. you're saying uh, there's more work to do we we need to look for all kinds of balances among all of these dimensions absolutely go ahead uh, 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 uh just a minute uh so we can uh, it, it, any other question or comment among you, or should we go to the audience? Yes, I, I would just like to. <laughs> add, uh, <laughs> yes. I would just like to add something. Uh, every year we are celebrating uh, this International Women's Day, you know, to acknowledge, recognize, celebrate women we, on whose uh, shoulders we are standing. Um, what I, I would like to point out is that um, the economic empowerment of women or the empowerment of uh, women generally um, shouldn't be any more um, justified by the, you know, trying to prove the business case around that, that is, um, is good for the community, is good for the family, is good for the community, is good for the country. But it should be seen as a right, you know, as, as actually as a fundamental human human right, you know, so that um, we should go beyond uh, um, trying, continuing to justify, you know, put up a uh, business cases uh, for these things. And I hope um, that um, 
that's you know that we are really pushing the needle and um, and that we we can fasten and quicken that process because um it does good to it would do good to everybody so what both of you are saying is let's stop just celebrating let's take it for granted that yes. we want to be happy that we want education that we want to be able to take care of ourselves and our families economically that we want to enjoy the beauty that we want to 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 let nature care of us and care for nature uh, so absolutely I, I i'm so with you it's 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 interesting how even the ceremony it feels exaggerated in terms of what are just plainly rights mm -hmm. that we should that we should realize. Uh, ah, wonderful. So now we have uh, Rabbi. We are going to open the the uh, the. Uh, okay, so we also have. Uh, we have a comment from Mary. Uh, yes, that change comes slowly. Well, it's true, but it's also amazing. Think of the change in Iran, right? Just in Nassim's family. Uh, it took just one generation. Now, there will be a lot of resistance, so it will take more generations. But uh, it, it's, it's, yeah, the time dimension flows very well here. Absolutely. I'm looking at all of the chats, uh, uh, and I wonder, uh, there it's uh, uh, Solim Ula, are you still here? Would you like to make a comment? Uh, that is about the Rohingya right here. And then, Rabbi, please give Monet the, the microphone. But, Solim, are you still here? Rabbi, are you there? Yes, I'm here. I okay. promoted the panelists, just mind? waiting for them to accept. Okay, so I would... Salim, that would be wonderful. Victoria, if you would like to say a few words from Ukraine. And certainly, uh, uh, Monet uh, speaks for Haiti. So we, we enlarge our, the world of our immediate panic, if it's okay with you. <laughs> so who is coming up? Monet, okay. Go ahead, Monet, please. Thank you, thank you very much. Oh, you don't, you can't see. She, me. She's actually in Rome, and but she's going to speak about Haiti. This is all very nuts, right? Because <laughs> <laughs> go ahead, Monet, please. Yes, uh, thank you very much. I uh, I wanted just to make a comment uh, about uh, the what the doctor was saying before. Uh, regarding the uh, the fact that women are highly affected by the climate change, and yes. and I wanted to say also effectively in Haiti, I'm talking on the uh, from the countryside, uh, women are in charge of fetching water, firewoods, and also going to uh, you know to wash the clothes. The clothes are being washed usually inside of in the river, and which is also a big font of pollution. But at the same time. It's uh, now that uh, most of the uh, rivers are completely um, dry. There is no more water in some of them because of erosion, because, you know, they cut all the trees to get water, uh, to get firewood, sorry, and then to uh, to prepare the, um, what they call charbon de bois, which, which they use to, to you know, to, to cook and, and, and do other things. And uh, now the women uh, have to go more like in the bush and it's more dangerous for them. And um, 
And yeah, this is just to uh, to say yes, we are experiencing also the same uh, the same thing there. And it would be great if uh, they could um, organize more. I I know that they have this in Kenya, the Green Belt. I think yes. experience. Yes, and yes, that would yes. be something extraordinary to help these women to uh to understand the need of, of for instance building like forests a small forest you know at uh, rich regional level where they would encourage them to plant uh you know to plant back to refurbish the 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 um the uh, the green area to have more green area so uh that could uh, help them also understanding the fact why the, the 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 sea it's eating the beach why are the houses being destroyed because the people they don't understand obviously they don't have access to all that technology and all the uh you know they have cell phones but mainly just to speak using whatsapp so you know people they don't really uh, they don't know what's going on but it would be really interesting to explain uh, the impact, you know, of yes. um, uh, the impact for them, and also uh, in terms of uh, of the rights, you, you do you know that uh, uh, spe uh, specifically in the countryside, women are still victim of a lot of uh, physical violence and domestic violence, and and it's uh, and I think for us uh, on that point of view, it's still very important to 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 commemorate the eighth of March because. Uh, um it's it's extremely uh important you know to remember at least in that day that you know uh they can speak for themselves although we are we have a matriarchal society i have to say this but it's uh it's not really uh it's not something that is so uh clear there is still a lot to do in terms of um of uh gaining uh, you know and keeping and uh, uh, and uh, uh, creating awareness yes and i think it's also it's has to do with education the people they need to have access okay, to monette, thank you thank you monette uh, monette is co-chair of this our center's working group on haiti uh, uh, anyone wants to comment back i mean irene i can immediately charge you with let's organize a panel a, a webinar exactly on this and i'm sure you will find the right person in kenya i'm afraid i'm afraid my my sister who received the nobel for the green belt is not with us uh, anymore she we lost her several years ago but uh, I'm sure you'll find the right person from Kenya. And Monette, maybe we will we will think about an, a, another international panel on this particular issue. Uh, thank you so much, Monette. Uh, now, Victoria, would you like to comment? Uh, Rabbi Hood. Oh, thank you so much, Victoria. You look so pretty too. <laughs> and we see the blue and yellow uh, in your background. Go ahead, Victoria, please. Hello? Hello? Yes. Uh, do you see me and hear me? Because I have some problems with connection. Uh, sorry. Your, uh, your brain is in the middle of war. Here we go. Go it, ahead, it, it, Yes, I, I don't know. You you see me or only here? <laughs> we, we, we hear you. Ah, okay, we see okay. A, we we nice, see a nice beautiful picture. <laughs> it's a great pleasure for me to, to, to be with you here today. I sent you a lot of greetings from Ukrainian women, women judges, because I'm a judge. And now we in this difficult and hard time for our country, we, we're still working and still fighting and our women are strong. And uh, I want to, to share uh, with you uh, this experience of my family because my grandmother was uh, uh, married uh, at 16 too. It was very popular in Soviet Union. 
to to married very young and formally in soviet union it was possible to have um, uh, education and job for women but in real it it, it was not fair because women must uh, work hard and uh, during the job all day and then must continue to work hard at home with children cooking cleaning and everything uh, uh, that's why it was very hard situation and uh, w uh, women were paid less and uh, 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 never uh, get uh, get high high uh, status uh, big job uh, uh, like boss it was very very hard but now it's better situation in general <laughs> now it's better and we have a war but we yes, will... but we have war. Another, <laughs> another hard problem. Yes, yes, yes. But women very strong. Uh, many women are volunteers in Ukraine and help army. And many women inside army. Yes. Yes. Thank you so much, Victoria. Thank Anyone you. wants to respond, please, panelists, you're all muted. I saw, um, Victoria, I saw your comment in the chat. Was that you who wrote about the sunflowers too, of those being in the mine yes. fields? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. I also have a have a picture, but I don't know because uh, 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 to deal with stress now during the war, I start to, to paint with oil and I have oh. a picture with sunflowers made oh. by, by me. <laughs> Wow. Oh, that's if, wonderful. If it's possible to, to share with you, I will try. <laughs> and so um, please share it with the center. If you send me the picture, we will put it on the website. With ah, this okay, webinar. I will try. I, I don't know how to do this, but I will try because I now I'm at home. And... <laughs> Thank you. I will. I will uh... <laughs> let, me Thank give you. You, let me give you my WhatsApp. Number. Okay, okay, I will send you, <laughs> of course. <laughs> Everybody else is welcome too. I, I can never refuse a painting. <laughs> Thank you very much. No, I, a, I will do it with pleasure. It, it, so it's plus one for the United States, and it's 917 <laughs> And we will put it on the website. <laughs> with, uh, <laughs> yeah. And and to share with all of you also, our awards dinner is coming up, and two of our our deeds are Ukrainian. One is the uh, Vadim Faber who opened the Jewish Center, Solomonica, at the war, during the war to everyone, uh, which is the ideal. And the other is to the filmmaker of the film Bucha, uh, which is the name of a city in Ukraine. Uh, and, and the hero in the film, it's a true story. It's a, a, a Jewish asylum seekers from Kazakhstan who received asylum in Ukraine and devoted his life to, he's still alive, bless God, to rescuing the people from Bucha and the, and the culture of Bucha, rescuing them from the Russian aggressors. So, uh, so these are another. It seems that it seems that my birthday month. I was just eighty four two days ago. So my birthday month is a month of of uh, transformations, <laughs> and you're part of my gift. <laughs> so I wanted to mention that to you, and what and the woman our D is uh, the senator from the United States, uh, Gabby Giffords. Those of you in the United States, I'm sure recognize her names. 
She was a senator in Arizona and was shot by one of her constituents. And ever since, bless God, she survived. And ever since she has, uh, she has um, worked on coming back to health and full functioning and devotes the rest of her life to gun control, to stop the killing and to mental health. So she's also one of our our these, which can give which gives you some idea uh, on how important we think uh, uh, these issues are. And I believe uh, that Solim is still here. Uh, here he is, Solim. Hello, you are in Bangladesh. Please speak to us. The one man who is put in this conversation, Salim, please, we are we are waiting for your voice. <laughs> Hello, can you hear me? Hello. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me, please? We hear you absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, first of all, I, I'd like to thank all of you and especially to you to organize such a great webinar uh, to talk about all the survivors who are struggling in uh, the life in this world. <clears throat> and let me introduce a, a little bit from myself. Uh, my name is Salim. I am a Rohingya a refugee youth from Bangladesh, Rohingya refugee camp. And I am a, by birth from Myanmar. Uh, my original uh, land is Myanmar. So we are positively uh, to Bangladesh uh, since 2017 due to our brutal government uh, did genocide on Rohingya uh, uh, with our Rohingya Muslim brothers and sisters. And so we have lost everything. Uh, currently about 1.2 million Rohingya refugees have been living on humanitarian assistance. As uh, you know, uh, I have contacted with you with lending. As also, you send me the link uh, to organize a webinar. And uh, yeah, I am. I would happy uh, to make a webinar on our Rohingya refugee crisis. And also, as I told you, we are uh, advocating for peace and building hope for our Rohingya people to empower. To empowerment and to develop uh, education and what is called and to foster in uh, education to empower women and girls to develop youth and girls. So it is our uh, purpose uh, to change, uh, to bring change in our community because uh, they are in this world uh, the most illiterate people in our community because we, our community never get a chance a higher for higher education in Myanmar because Myanmar government didn't allow us to go university, to go college and for higher education. So even uh, um, our my mother is uh, don't know uh, English alphabet. So uh, we want uh, to educate women, girls, boys, children because uh, at least uh, if we educate to our women our women can read the name uh, can read a uh, phone number can read a uh, what is called a a little bit a uh, understand uh, will understand what is the value of the education so it is uh, also we are uh, organizing training a uh, to develop youth and boys like a a community empowerment and good, uh, effective, good communication, gender-based violence, because uh, actually uh, gender-based violence is very important uh, topic because uh, we, we should know what is the equality. A uh, boy and girls are the same. Uh, uh, that will, uh, what is called, that will deliver to our community to understand what is the equality uh, between a male and female. So it is very, a very essential 
for our community, especially. So uh, we, we are uh, empowering, uh, empowering like this, uh, uh, and also we will organize in future uh, uh, human rights and uh, PSEA protection, sexual uh, exploitation and abuse, and also protection child uh, like this. Uh, as we know, uh, many uh, what is called many topic uh, to empower uh, the whole community. So, uh, but uh, we uh, we we don't have any permanent uh, donor and permanent source. We are running uh, with uh, people contribution because we have a what is called a friend uh, who is uh, live in UK and he has set up a fundraising campaign and people contribute little money and we we use uh, those money for education for classes and for training and for feeding uh, the hungry children, etc. So as uh, we know, we our uh, organization name is Rohingya Community Partners, RCP. We are also in Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram. So if also we are looking to join as a partner with registered organization and because uh, to carry our activities easily. So if anyone here, if any donor here, uh, you you can ask any, uh, you want more uh, to know about us. Uh, I am uh, the founder of RCP. Uh, I can uh, tell you everything uh, what you want. It is really helpful uh, if you are joined with us uh, uh, to empower our community, to develop our community. So last year we have taught uh, 300 children a uh, hard, very hardly. So we have done finally a uh, final exam uh, uh, on, uh, recently. So now we are seeking a uh, books for new grade because students are promoting for new class, for new grade. So we want books. So uh, if we get books, then we can start our classes. But our ambition is to uh, to promote uh, this year 500 students. So that is depend on people contribution. If people will contribute more, we can uh, establish more school. Then more students can study. So just only $12 uh, for a student book course. So you can sponsor for five children book course. You can sponsor for 10 children book course. You can sponsor the whole... Uh, school material book course it is really helpful for our uh, community for our children so that is my uh, my request and also uh, i apologize if any mistake in my uh, conversation so thank you very much all of you for listening me anyone wants to respond first before i do nasim please uh, you have to unmute. Hi. Uh, so everyone is very inspiring. Victoria, Monet, Salim, everyone is amazing. Uh, the stories are unbelievable, every single one of them. Um, I was really inspired by uh, Salim, actually, like uh, being such an advocate for women's rights. Uh, and um, it looks like they understood that with empowering women, the whole community will be empowered. So that's a key to freedom. And that's a key for uh, empowering the entire community. I left my email for you, Salim. Uh, please feel free to contact me and we could talk more about that. I would love to hear more about your community. And if I could help, I, I would love to help. <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I will contact you through uh, email. And also, it is very helpful if uh, I get a uh, WhatsApp because uh, uh, I, WhatsApp is very easy for contacting me. So, okay, let's uh, contact through Gmail. Then I will take WhatsApp from you. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, I will just add this to Victoria. Just to... Victoria asked about the number. Let me do that so I don't forget. Uh, 
There we go. Very good. <laughs> Done. Uh, anyone else wants to respond? So if not, um, uh, so, so, uh, sorry. <laughs> Salim, if, uh, as I mentioned to you when we corresponded, it would be a very good idea to have a, a, a webinar specifically about the Rohingya situation. And, and there you will, in addition to Nassim's kind response, which is marvelous, uh, uh, it, it would be probably more widely effective uh, to bring your voice as widely as possible. So let's, let's, uh, I'm very open to your suggestions, who should be the best speakers for such a webinar in addition to you, uh, so we can speak uh, more about this. This is exactly what the center is for. So um, our, our, we welcome you with open arms. I promise the audience that you will all say a last word. So uh, go ahead. Let's go the uh, the 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 opposite. Uh, so, so the opposite sequence. So Simona, what message would you like to share with the with this wonderful audience <laughs> and with us? And you have to unmute. Um, what would you like people to stay with? Yes. Okay. Again, I say thank you for invite, inviting me here. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it's a pleasure to be here to speak about my grandma who inspired me mm -hmm. to, to tell one little story and to give the women in the world the peace and the strength to go in front to because it's not easy maybe in europe it's easy but in some other countries it's not easy and um Still, some people have no chance, or some women have no chance to go to school, to get the education, to do. And like we hear before, education is the key. So that's our my last for today. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you dear. <laughs> Larry, please. Your message. Yeah, I always have to think of uh, words of Chaya Stoika because she had so many that she has these sayings. And the one that we're using for the next exhibit in Austria is um, hope is something that strengthened us. So that message of hope to me stays in my heart from everybody I've heard here. You're, you're wonderful people and everybody who's commented and I've learned a lot. So Thank you so much for, and thank you, Yael, for organizing this as well and giving us all hope that we have a, a good future. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, Irene, please. You have to unmute. Yes. <laughs> okay. So my last uh, message, my last uh, word would be, um, that we continue to drive the women agenda as the um, the theme for this year's um, um, IWD, invest in women um, and uh, to accelerate uh, progress. Um, to that theme, I would add that uh, when women prosper, you know, the whole society prospers. So it is in our best interest, in everybody's best, best interest, to close them, um, those gender gaps. Thank you. Exactly. Thank you so much. 
Nassim, please. You can, yeah. I really appreciate this opportunity. I uh, it was great to hear from the other audiences too. That's what uh, the story is very inspiring. Um, and I just wishing and hoping for world peace uh, with the help of women actually being an uh, active participate and bringing more peaceful uh, vibe to the world. Thank you, thank you. I, I I actually can't thank you enough. Uh, this this is just a perfect product that we all created together, <laughs> and uh, we continue. We simply continue. We have a working group on women and. Knowing Irene and Nassim, we you will hear much more <laughs> from us. <laughs> and please, all of us continue. All of us, yes, let's continue together. Uh, we will have we are having a whole bunch of webinars coming up. Uh, some of you who have. Uh, attended some of the um, uh, reparative justice webinars that are very important. They, they are in collaboration with an NGO called the Yellow Flowers and with the Office of the Prosecutor General in Ukraine to actually help educate the justice system how to interact with victims of these horrible crimes that are going on today, be it children, be it women, be it soldiers themselves, be it torture victims, refugees. The world is so full and for, tragically of all of these crimes. And, it, and we want to promote healing, but also justice so to help prevent. So uh, we will have one, uh, the number four in the series webinar that will focus on children. Children victims, okay? Children victim witnesses. And the challenges we have in speaking to them and listening to them, right? And, and helping them help the case against the perpetrators, which is a huge challenge, you can imagine. Uh, and also because April is coming up, we will have a webinar on Rwandan with Rwandan authors who's, who are going to speak about teaching children, right? These are parents who now have little children after the genocide. And what do we want to teach for the future, right? So it will both men and women and we're going to be, I promise, very interesting. We're going to have a webinar also in, in April. April, you know, is genocide month. So we're going to have a webinar on the Armenia situation, which is again another terrible place, but with amazingly resilient people with rich culture um, and, a, and a history of repeated genocide, and on and on. So you will all receive the announcements and please keep joining us. Uh, I think we have absolutely began the most wonderful International Women's Day together. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Yael. Thank you. Says, thank you. Thank All you. of you. Thank, thank you, you very everybody. Much. Thank you, Simona. And uh, Nazimi, love you. Yes. <laughs> thank you. All right. Thank, thank you. you.